and welcome to this session of how to configure Kubernetes with component config, a new technique in Kubernetes. Uh, I'm quickly about myself. I'm from Finland. I just graduated from high school. Now, currently I'm doing my military service, which is mandatory in Finland. But after, after that, I'll do my university studies. Um, I've been in the project for three years, about, and um, doing a lot of nice things with the community. Uh, most recently, I've been doing Kubedium, working on that. Um, and now it's a pleasure to that we're going GA, the next release. So that's that's really fun. Um, and I do contracting for WeWorks, uh, working on open source like Kubedem. And now also from this summer, I thought, well, we gotta get rid of the flags sometime from component com uh, from components because we don't like the the negative sides of them. So then, well, let's do it. And now we've done the first work, and there's more to come. And that's why we're all here today. Here today. So what are we going to talk about? First, what's the current status of component config? Where are we at? And that means, for example, limitations. Uh, what can be done better? Uh, where do we want to go in, in the future uh, with this effort? Um, And also, I'm going to try to show a, a demo here about uh, it's on this GitHub site, so you can check out the code yourself. But basically, implementing this code that I, I'm showing on the slides is also available on GitHub, uh, where, I, where I'll, I'll talk about and uh, have an example of this practice. And the roadmap for, for the future. Also, it's important, so uh, what, what's really nice is most of this coding has actually, like implementing this component config, has been done by Chinese contributors that I've uh, collaborated with. So that's, that's worked really well and is nice to see. Okay, first, where are we at today? And what is this thing? Um, basically, we all know that Kubernetes releases as a at a fast pace. Uh, there are new changes, there are new features coming all the time. Uh, but it also comes with a not so good side, because if you have to keep up with all the new features that are added, uh, and there are also many that features that are removed or deprecated at some times. And when you then migrate or upgrade, for from version one to version two, or like 111 to 112, or 112 to 113, similar. You really have to dig into all the change log that is the, the huge release notes and see if some flag has changed in the in the components and take action as required before upgrading. Uh, so that can be very dangerous if you just flip the version and defaults have changed. Uh, you're now running with different a different set of configuration than you used to. So it, it's evolving, evolving very fast. So when backwards incompatible changes are made, they can break your cluster pretty easily with, with the flags. So right now, if you want to set a parameter, to the API server, for example, the service subnet or similar, what address it should listen on, then, well, you spe specify dash dash bind address or another similar flag. But if that flag was removed in a version, then if you upgrade, it's gonna exit, uh, the, the component is gonna fail because it doesn't recognize that anymore. Uh, and when you do upgrade, you need to build, like, if version is this, then include this flag. If version, version is this other thing, 
then have this replacement, and if the version is some third thing, do some hacky workaround. But we all know that the Kubernetes API has worked pretty well in defining our applications and defining how our program should be run. Uh, we all, I mean, not everybody maybe likes YAML, but at least it's a representation of the object and it's kind of the Kubernetes standard how to do things at the moment. So what is, this is, uh, yeah, the flag names and functionality between them is kind of in inconsequent between the API server, controller manager, scheduler, and similar. So there's inconsistencies and we're using flags where we could use instead uh, structured and versioned configuration because we also, flags are only using key value. Uh, we have no structure there uh, and there's no version. I can't say I want to use the flag schema version one or I want to use some other thing. So instead, we want Kubernetes components to ideally have just one argument, one flag, uh, which is config. So with this, uh, we want to read structured and versioned configuration. Uh, and it looks like a normal Kubernetes API object, but it's just a file. It's just the, the like similarity to, to a Kubernetes API server uh, object. So the current, the current situation is that most components of Kubernetes, thanks to the efforts we did this summer, now at least have dedicated uh, Kubernetes repos. So we have case.io that Q, uh, slash kubelet contain that repo contains the struct, the configuration structs for the kubelet, which you can use to write kubelet component config. Uh, and the kubelet is the most tested component with component config at this time. Uh, the other, because it's in beta, the other structures are in alpha. So I wouldn't use them maybe quite yet, but when we go further, we hope to graduate these as soon as possible and make it consistent for all components. So the kubelet, kubeproxy, and kubescheduler can all read the config file. We have work to do with the controller manager and the API server. They can't. So there's some internal refactoring to be done there. There's also this problem of when you're using flags or have, have very different component, uh, like very different uh, structures, uh, maybe for like for both the pro proxy cube scheduler and cube controller manager and the kubelet as well are similar to that, that they host a very lightweight HTTP server. So this HTTP server serves some basic endpoints like, um, like health checks, uh, so some version endpoints and similar for debugging metrics, such small things, but it's all the same code that is behind the scenes used. Still, this code that is implementing the metrics, implementing the version checks, HTTP server, is using totally different configuration structs because we have no standards here in, in between these components. It's just like how the author of the, this code liked it at the time. So now with this effort, we also want to extract what's, for example, leader election. Configuration for leader election is a generic thing. You want to do leader election with Kubernetes. Then include this struct in your component. And for example, now they can be shared between the scheduler and the controller manager. 
Right now, these, these fields and structs are duplicated, and that's unnecessary. Same for debugging configuration and the HTTP server stuff. So what this could look like to visualize is something like this. And this, this is kind of the, the end goal. Uh, the most important part and why this starts to look like a Kubernetes API style object, we have the API version and we have the kind. Uh, you could, this also is the same format as, the, for example, CRDs are using. So it's very familiar to all Kubernetes developers and pretty straightforward to use. Uh, all component configs in Kubernetes are under config.cates.io. So under that, the component has its own API group. So in an API group, there are a set of, of structs that make up this configuration schema. Um, and each component gets its own API group. Then the kind should be the component, the component, the name of the component, and configuration. We'll see more about this later. But what's great about this is when we first have, like we release 1.13, uh, or say we release 1.14, uh, we go GA stable with the component config feature. We would have, then all versions would be V1. But if we do some huge like change in the structure, then in one, 117 or something, uh, we can bump the version, have a different schema, we can bump the version to v2. So that means when the user upgrade to 117, they can either specify this file, which is v1, or they can use the new, more advanced schema. Because the, the component of the new version will know both formats and con convert between them automatically. So, and then we also get some structure. We see that under the controller st struct, we have different controllers. Every controller can have their own key value pair. And if there are, for example, there's a generic controller manager thing, if we want to put generic controllers, uh, we can have those there, but then you can also implement your own, add that. An example is, for, uh, an example is the cloud controller manager which has the similar things to the normal cube controller manager, but, and it should have the same look and feel here, but it should still be different per cloud. So the pitch is this configuration that you write should comply with most uh, Kubernetes API conventions and have that kind of UX. And that makes it familiar to other people. Uh, when upgrading, you must be backwards compatible. So if you release in a new component, v2, and you already supported v1, you have to be able to still read v1 so users can upgrade without um, any like downtime or any, any like problems. So that is, that is really important, and that is what component config is solving that flags can't do. And with this, we can also start to do things like, um, when we put the configuration in a file, we can also start appending patches. We can have one base kubelet configuration for the whole cluster, for example, and we can then if we have a special kubelet that should implement some GPU feature or hardware accelerated thing and need special configuration parameters, we can, for example, use customize or some other patching framework of YAML, JSON, whatever. Now, the examples are showed here in YAML, but JSON works equally well like any Kubernetes component, uh, any Kubernetes resource. So 
now that we have these kind of things and have the file in a uh, the configuration in a file, we can start doing high le higher level systems and these GitOps patterns, as we call them. Like you can store the ultimate truth of what is in your cluster is stored in Git in some Git repo. Then you propose changes to that Git repo to the configuration. Like I want to apply this kind of patch to our cluster. Then it's easily it's it can be easily seen in this YAML. Well, I changed that value to that, and then uh, can be done like any other Kubernetes object, like we deploy our apps today. And as we said, we can now share a lot of the common things. So if you want to do a component on Kubernetes that supports lead election, you don't have to like write all that code reinvent that wheel again. You can use the shared types in Kubernetes. And now we also get consistency for free. So this talk is a bit on like the SIG cluster lifecycle side. Uh, I'm a lead for SIG cluster lifecycle. But it also is pretty much API machinery. So it's good if you have prior knowledge of how the Kubernetes API machinery works, because this is going to dive into how it works. But I'll try to explain as, sim as simple as possible how the structure is. So now with the new refactor, um, we store the external versions in a component repo. So case.io, which is a uh, alias for github.com, slash Kubernetes has new repos. It has kubelet, kubeproxy, kube controller manager, and kube scheduler. These repos right now only contain these types, these component config types. So it's easier to it's easy for you if you are building a higher level system utilizing component config, it's easy for you to vendor these. You don't need to vendor the whole of Kubernetes, which is very annoying for m many and impossible for some. But the internal versions, we'll, we'll get to what internal and external means in a second, uh, are stored in, still in the Kubernetes package. And all the rest of the kubelet code and whatnot is in the Kubernetes. So we've only extracted this one API package to its own repo for easier vendoring. That is what's been done. And here we have the, the example again. The API group, as said, should be the component's name, dot config, dot case, dot io. If you implement your own components, you can have whatever you want. But for this Kubernetes-specific ones, that is the pattern. And then the API versions should, be, should work like any other API version. Here's an example, some example values. And the kind name should be written like that, like in the example here. So here we have the, the shared config problem. So as you see here, these are real world examples of what we have right now. So the kube proxy um, configuration group uh, if you are a Kubernetes client, if you're talking to the API so you need some parameters. Like, where is the kube config I should access? How often f may I talk to the API server with request per second burst? And how should I talk to the API server? Should I use, use plain JSON, or should I use newer protobuf, or whatever? So these are configuration parameters that are similar to any Kubernetes component, like, globally. Um, and in kubeproxy, this is OK. This is uh, scoped under the client connection struct. But that is not the case with the kubelets. The kubelet hosts all of these fields just on the root and have other names as well. We have kube config with a little c there and kube config with a capital C and so on and so forth. Kube API burst, burst. Kube API request per second, etc. So this is pretty much the same. 
but it's written in different ways because it's been different authors and now there's no consistency for the admin that is configuring this. I have to remember that if I'm talk using the kubelet, doing stuff with the kubelet, I have to write stuff in a, some way. And if I'm using the kube proxy, I should do, use a different pattern. So this, this kind of unification, we, we want to we, we're striving towards uh, by making these shared types. So instead, the shared types will exist in a generic Kubernetes repo like case.io API machinery or case.io API server or whatever. We might create a case.io slash component or something. We don't know. But somewhere that, that is easily accessible and easily vendorable. So, I don't know if you're familiar with what an external version and internal version of the API is, uh, but here I'll try to explain that. So, an external type is some set of structs that can be written to a file and that can be read from a file. So, that by definition means we need to, to set like, when, I, when I'm reading a file, I need to know what kind of version is this, what kind of object is this, and what group does it belong to? Is it like a deployment or is it a component configuration or is it like a CRD? I need to know what kind of thing it is. That's why we have API version and kind. And that's also uh, that's always in um, that's always the case with external versions. They all always said that. And an external type must also have JSON tags, because you know that in Go, uh, lowercase if, if a field starts with lowercase, it's private. If a field starts with uppercase, it's public. So and in, in when we're writing these JSON uh, or like uh, YAML files or whatever, we always, kind of always, start with a lowercase. So that means if we we can't read them to Go, because the Go interpreter thinks they're they're private fields and it doesn't recognize them. So that's why we must set all, always um, JSON tags, which are lowercase, which override the default field value. So an internal type, there should be only one internal type in the system. So in the component, there should be this one internal struct that is never written anywhere. It's never um, read from any place. It's only used by the component itself. And why we, it should not have JSON tags. Uh, and yeah, so why we have this is because we might, or we want to support many external versions. We want to support loading your configuration from v1 and v2 and v3. We, all, we want to support loading those and using those in our component, in our application. For example, Kubernetes supports many, uh, many versions of the, the apps API, for example. You can specify deployments of type version 1 beta 1, version 1 beta 2, version 1. So we, we should have this functionality. So then we create many external tags and create conversions, or uh, many external versions, uh, and create conversions from that external type and its schema to the same internal type. And that same internal type we use everywhere in our code. That also means if defaulting changes between versions, we also can track that by having only the external types should be defaulted. So if we have a default of 10 requests per second in our application in version one, and we realize that is not a good default, we need at least 100 requests per second. We can bump the API version, and now in the new API version, we use the new default. Yeah, so we register conversions from external. So we read the file, 
we decode it into the external type. We then convert it into the internal type. And when it is the internal type, we can start using it in the application. And to reduce the need for writing conversions, like this field is in, in the external type, is this field in the internal. For everything, there's a lot of auto-generated code. So I've written a sample Go application for this to demonstrate that it works. Um, and it's accessible in the GitHub location under github.com slash luxus. Mm, and I'll, I'll now show uh, what different what you need in order to implement this. So if you want to do this for your application, uh, you, can, you can implement this using this pattern. So here's the, here's the structure. We have a CMD folder, we have a package folder. In our package, in the top level config, we have the internal type. That is just one. And then we have many external types. We support now v1 and v beta 1. So v beta 1 was our first version. Uh, we thought it was pretty good, but we realized we had to make some changes uh, before we released the stable version, which is v1. And then we have a scheme package which, which contains references to both, to all, all the types. So, and it's important to note that the structure of the internal type and the uh, latest, like in this case, uh, we won, is, is pretty much the same. There's no extra conversion code there. It's just like, it has exactly the same schema. But between we beta 1 and the internal type, we need to do conversions. So that's why we have conversion go in we beta 1, but not in we won. And we'll, we'll go walk through what, this, what should be existing in these uh, Go files. So the, the sample application here will basically, will have three flags. Uh, it has one config flag, which allows you to specify a component config. And it has some overrides as well. So on a graphical level, it seems like this. So if we set a config file, I realize I've uh, missed the flag name. It should be dash dash config and config file. So if we've set that, we, the application reads it into the external type. When we have it in the external type, there might be fields that are not set. So we default it. We, when we then have defaulted the external type, we convert it in the, into internal so we can use it. But if we instead uh, specified just a flag, like I don't need much extra configuration. I just want to, uh, for an HTTP server, I don't need a lot of TLS stuff, for example. I just need to set override the bind address. So I'm, I'm fine with just having one flag. Uh, then we start with uh, an empty external type. We apply the flag value, in this case, like bind address. Uh, we default it and convert it to the internal type. And now we can continue using the same code part there and just uh, marshal this to bytes again. So you might have seen how Kubernetes API types look, what they look like. Uh, this is basically the uh, what it what it looks like. Normal Go uh, Go configuration. Then we have a scheme which registers all these. Uh, like there, we set v1 beta one. Here is the internal type, and we have conversion functions between these. Then we specify some tags for auto generation. So there will be automatic co automatically generated code here. And we also register defaults that if a field is not set, then we set it to some default value. 
And here, for example, here is a, a sample conversion code. So a field that was earlier renamed server address has now been moved into a dedicated server object and address. And then we have a scheme which registers all internal and external types. So the scheme does the automatic conversion. And now what it looks like when we have this set up, we can read a file by just calling runtime decode into and give the bytes that we want to decode and the internal object. We don't need to do any special, we don't have to write more code for, for it to uh, like do conversion. We don't have to do if this, then that. We just, that is all done for us. We just need to say, here are the bytes, here's the internal object. Parse any external version to me. If we want to populate defaults, we create the object, we call scheme default. Or if we want to convert it between objects, between versions, we just call scheme convert. And if we want to marshal this again to bytes, then we just create some kind of serializer. It can be YAML, JSON are made by default, but we can do whatever. Like if I want to have a, I don't know what's, what's KSON net thing or whatever kind of format, I can create my own serializer. But then what's important is that we create a version specific serializer. So we say that I want to output bytes again with v1 structure, or I want to output it with v2 structure, and then just call runtime encode. So what's done and what's going to be uh, better in the future? Uh, we've done the initial work for Kubernetes components. Now we have this framework that you can use this. So like, say you're creating an operator, then it's very good for like the consistency and for your users. If you need configuration for your operator specifically, then you can adopt this same pattern uh, that's shown in this repo. It's prob we're probably gonna create some better documentation here in 1, 12, and 13 as well, how to write your own component configuration. And graduating the schemas of, uh, of these to alpha to beta is also going to be important. So like the Q proxy is now alpha. We want to make it better. We have no API server component config at all. We should fix that. We should create component configs. So now the cloud providers, for example, are moving out of three. Then they should also have the same look and feel as a normal controller manager. Things like that. So uh, if you're interested in the actual code, the like deep details of how it works, you can check out the repo linked in this presentation. Uh, but as a recap, component config is about this pattern. It's a convention uh, that we use. For example, there are conventions for CRDs as well that is very similar. We just apply this, these Kubernetes API conventions on any configuration and reuse the benefits of Kubernetes, why, what makes Kubernetes so great. And when we have configuration in a file, as said, now we can start applying uh, instance overrides. We can start doing patches. We can start doing this GitOps style deployments because that's very hard to do if you're using flags. Then if you need a lot of if then else configuration like so that it gets complex as a new program itself uh, that it's applying flags, then it's not good. But if you have one file, the definite source of truth, then, then that's pretty convenient. And we're trying to unify the UX of using Kubernetes, trying to make it easier for admins to use it. But this can be done for any Kubernetes ex extension or any application. Any Go program can, can do this.
and yeah, now we have the external types in so that you can render them. So now you also can write application using these these tracts. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, questions? Should, should I give? Uh, I think you are the leader of the cluster lifecycle, so you probably know the cluster API and uh, how do you plan to apply this on the cluster API and uh, maybe also the cloud provider and make sure all of them are following the same pattern in terms of our configurations. Yeah, so the, the cluster API does this already. It's, it's using this convention since the beginning. Uh, but with regards to the cloud providers, yes, we're working on that. Or also, we like help with that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's in the roadmap, as Sen said. Right now, the, we don't have, we haven't plumbed this through in all places in Controller Manager, but we're planning to do so, so that it gets consistent. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.